So. And you tell her I'm the, I'm, I'm the nicest white man you've ever heard, you've ever had cheeks a black man. <laughs> and then come pick up your 500 man as you go to your room. Okay, no, no, go. I'll sing your praises. I mean, Jacob Zimmer has a praise thing, so why not? Who's my praise I know. 500 band, I'll sing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, tonight we have a special, a special guest appearance from uh, our very own Sam. He's got, I think, over two years recovery. Yeah, he's got over two years recovery. Hi, Lee, and hello, Michelle. And Sam is very special to all of us because. Uh, of how he's grown in his life and where he's come from to where he is today which is quite inspirational to, to a lot of people everybody can get something out of out of everybody's story in some other way so I hope you all it's my five years and Mr. and Anthony's uh, 15 years on the 28th and I'm on the my five years is on the 25th and yeah I will, I'll be sharing again soon I'm just introducing Sam Sam onto the live feed because it's Sam's first appearance and he needs a he needs to be introduced. Hello Vanessa. And I think you'll I don't know from what angle Sam is coming, but I'm sure whatever angle he comes from, somebody will get something out of it. So let me not keep you all up and let me introduce you to Samuel. Have a lovely evening, ladies and gents, and God bless you all. James, you must just speak up a bit louder. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Graham, for that introduction. Um, hi, my name is Sam. I'm a recovering addict. I've been on the farm close to two years now. Um, um, yeah. I'm a bit seat up nervous as you can probably tell. I'll do my best. So in in dwarf strokes, um, I was born in Zimbabwe. Um, Harare, the capital. <laughs> and um, yeah, so looking back, I can't see anything in my childhood that would explain why oh, I'm here tonight. To but we need to turn it um, so. Don't take your phone. You need to come closer. Is that better? Speak. Okay. Sorry, we were having some technical difficulties. All right. <coughs> um, let's start again. <laughs> we got. Yeah, you can't see me. Um, ish. It's. You know, I can't help you with that, eh? All right, but... Um, hey, Richie. Um, so I was born in Zim, and... I can't if that would explain why I did up in a rehab. There was no trauma, there was no... Um, there was nothing but love. And... Um, my childhood was actually you know, pretty, pretty good, pretty, pretty decent. But um, <laughs> oh yeah, how's it glad is. Um, but it was not ideal in some cases. It would have been great if I, you know, had spent as much time as I had. Um, with, you know, my family as, as I'd have preferred to. But, um, 
Um, thank you for the support. Um, okay, so my childhood was great. Um, I grew up in an extended family full of academics, um, from both parents right through to my aunts and even my parents. Everyone was involved in education in one way or another. Um, so, opposed to knowledge and to religion from a very young age and it wasn't that I didn't know God I just knew about God and as, as the story unfolds hopefully I'll be able to share that journey that I've, I've gone through to discover who God really is and it was only really on this farm that I came to <laughs> that I came to know to know God and to begin to understand it. So let's see, childhood. Great childhood. When I was about twelve, um, we moved this side. Or oh, I joined my, my dad, who was a who's a lecturer, um, associate professor at a leading university here and he'd moved here before with my mom and after grade seven I came to join them here and funnily enough it was more of a culture shock than I realized at the time to give an example up until then white people only seen on TV. They weren't actually people. And coming this side and being exposed not just to new things, but new people's new way of being and actually a new family. Because I've been raised by my maternal grandparents. And now I was coming to know my own parents. So in that were a lot of journeys of discovery and yeah, it wasn't navigated so well, but it was, you know, looking back, it was really nice. Um, so let's get to the drugs. I'm sure everyone's <laughs> been waiting for the war stories. Um, Okay, um, so I think uh, my case was this was the same as a lot of a lot of addicts. It started off benign, as in my first exposure to substances was when we moved to this when I moved to South Africa, and. And there was a. Uh, sorry, give me a second. I'm still a bit. And I'd like to believe it's similar to how a lot of people introduced to substances, in a unassuming, almost innocent manner. For some, I've heard it was through a family member offering a drink. For me, it was. Um, a pharmacist <laughs> offering a painkiller. Um, I'd always had problems with my eyesight and I started getting headaches and so mm, I went and I'm sure especially in the US many can relate to going to look for help and being exposed to the devil that is opiates and that's where I began my journey with substances it was with an over-the-counter well non-addictive um, opiate and something was triggered in me 
Now, just to go off on a tangent. Um, I am one of those dual diagnosis cases. I have to battle not just my disease, but also bouts of depression, schizophrenia, things like that. So, which came first is irrelevant, chicken-egg kind of scenario. But both have to be addressed. And during that time, I think I was 12 or 13, it felt like both were being addressed. I'd started experiencing this, looking back now, depression. It was characterized in a desire not to wake up the next day. I would find myself lying in bed, praying to God that he'd take me away. And I can still remember the first nights when I had those painkillers and it was wonderful. It was great. I mean, my migraine was gone. Yay. But also that ache that was within, that was also gone. And that's how my love affair began. And it only escalated. As I progressed through high school, so too did my like a glider. So too did my usage. So much so that I began to find ways to increase the, the potency and turn and extract as much codeine as I could from these pills. And I think that's how I survived, you know, the emotional roller coaster that is high school. I mean, on the one hand, I was sitting in a class of 30 students and I'm the only black guy there. So that, that sort of unease was already there. Never mind the whole, uh, the, the changes that puberty and things and such bring about. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, so, and so eventually I, I lost sight in both my eyes. Um, so I had to go for <clears throat> sorry, I had to go for two corneal transplants to restore vision. And in that, I still managed to continue using. I even justified the using. And it seemed benign at the time. It's something I wasn't going around the corner to meet a drug dealer somewhere. I was just going to the local pharmacy, they knew my name, they knew my family. Um, so it was, it was one of those things where it didn't feel like I was using drugs, but I was using drugs. So in that time, I managed to make some actual meaningful friendships. But it was always with a questionable crowd. In, in, in those relationships, I managed to, to find um, and value, to find a, a sense of belonging. And another funny thing about my, my relationship with drugs is that when I was on drugs, my character defects, my shortcomings, my flaws were hidden. And it's only those who are to me who would see me when I was sober, when I was on the come down, whatever it was, who would bear the brunt of the, the darker side, the <laughs> darker side, the, the monster. And as the saying goes, we hurt those we love the most. And so it was the same. To the world, I was, you know, 
lovable. But at home, slowly but surely, the friction, the the isolating, the the withdrawing from <gasps> that community was felt, and it did take its toll. But it was only once I reached varsity, how I got there, only God knows. But at varsity, that's when I discovered marijuana, and that's when <laughs> the downward spiral really began. The painkillers were causing, you know, complications. I was starting to worry about my liver, my kidneys, and this wonderful, magical, natural drug was there, and it seemed to do the same thing. The depression was dealt with, and any pain, discomfort, social unease was also dealt with. And so, I simply crossed one substance for another, substituted. And everything was great. Well, or so I thought. And it was entire, it was over two years, I'd say. My marks began to go deteriorate. I started stopping attending, I stopped attending lectures. I spent more time high, smoke all every day, wake and bake, that kind of lifestyle. And somehow my parents had their suspicions, but they hadn't, they didn't have the, the proof, the evidence. They couldn't definitively say that I was using drugs. Uh, but these things tend to catch up with you. And by 2014, if I recall correctly, my mind began to freak Apologies for that. Um, so, where was I? Um, ah, yes. Psychosis. Um, uh, it was... 2014, and my mind began to give in. The, the highs and the trips began to become darker. It began to be harder to get past the depression. And so, and so it began, so began my, my, my dealings with rehab. I went to my first rehab in 2014, and I can still remember openly saying to counselors, fellow patients that, yes, okay, I can't smoke weed anymore. It's driving me crazy. But I'll still drink. I'll definitely still drink. I mean, I, at that stage, I, was, I wasn't really into alcohol. I was strictly a pothead. So for me, alcohol was just maybe a shot here, maybe a drink there. It, it, it wasn't really my poison. But it, it didn't register that it would be. So by, <laughs> by the time I left rehab, I was adamant that I was going to go out and get two shots of tequila to celebrate and I did I still remember going to some bar in observatory and getting my two shots and slowly but surely two shots became four four shots became a beer a beer became two by the end of 2015 I was drinking two bottles of wine, it, it was starting to dawn on me that maybe I really, I really was that bad. 
the situation at home was yeah terrible they what my family had to endure well I, I hope that I know that God is but I hope that I can make amends to them for it the trauma the physical trauma is always you know the easiest to heal maybe even the financial but emotional scars only God can can work on those but I can do my part as well so things were getting bad so much so that my dad in desperation sent me back to Zim on a farm his um, our ancestral home and you know he was he already tried sending me to two rehabs he tried you know the tough love approach kicking me out of the house none of it seemed to get through and <laughs> thank you Renee and eventually this was the only option you, you, you could think of I was destroying the family his home so maybe he thought a change of environment would help but as we all know the problem wasn't the alcohol it was, it was me the way I how I became how I became when I drank or when I used drugs so there I was back in my homeland <laughs> uh, but of course 10 k's away you know that's about an hour's walk if I remember correctly about 12 k's yeah an hour's walk away was a bottle store about 20 minutes away was a weed dealer and so even in darkest Africa the drugs were there the alcohol was there so nothing really changed but the situation did the better it got worse and worse and worse until eventually by my own actions I ended up in prison and so now this is I've had my institutions now I'm at the jail stage I dice with death so many times already that it's a miracle I came through every time but now I swear I couldn't just walk out when I wanted to I couldn't just leave when I wanted to I couldn't I couldn't even you know go to the bathroom by myself there were no doors there was no privacy there was you know there was a chance to change but even there there were still drugs <laughs> even in prison I was able and I was willing to get those drugs and I did I didn't care if it was weed I didn't care about the psychosis it might bring on because in my mind I thought <clears throat> it's better to be deranged than detained and so my my desire and skills at escaping Amen. Amen. Um, my skills and my my craving for escape was still there, even in a place where I couldn't <laughs> physically escape. Eventually, after almost yeah, close to a year, my father 
dropped the charges he played against me. And looking back now, <coughs> at the time I remember the rage at finding out that he was the one who had laid the charges. He was the one who'd got me locked up, who'd put me in that hellhole. But while I was in that hole, it dawned on me that I was the one who'd fallen in. I was the one who'd refused help to get out of that hole. And so I could and I did forgive him for having to do that. For forcing him to be so desperate that he had to arrest to get his own son arrested. So thankfully there was no resentment for it. And through that experience my Relationship with God began to deepen. <laughs> when you, when you're locked up in, in, you know, four walls, and all you have is chess and the Bible, <laughs> you're gonna turn to either or both to occupy yourself. That I guess that's where the correctional aspect of things comes in, and. I felt him there. I felt God's presence there. I'd always known intellectually that he's there. But to know on an experiential or to know here, yeah, to feel that presence is something I dare to yeah, I, I would I would dare to say was worth <laughs> was worth ending up in prison for. So, even after I was released from jail, I was on the right path for a few months. But, without working any program, and without dealing with the root cause of why I got there in the first place, I just went back and something I've seen here in my time was I hadn't surrendered I just resigned um, a concept I've, I've learned recently where I resigned myself to my fate but I didn't surrender to the fact that I have this illness, I can't use any form of mind altering substance, whether it's from the pharmacy, from the dealer, or from the bottle store. And I guess it was inevitable that I would go back to my my love. And it's it's insane to think about how I was so willing to give up on relationships, on friendships, on any sort of human connection in favor of the drug. For me, it was an absolute, it was, um, Some, yeah, it was something that I loved more so than anything else. And so, thank you, Mr. Schuler. And so it was. It was inevitable that I would return to those drugs when I got the key back. I'd done my time. I'd stabilized in prison because 
you don't get arrested and held indefinite in a, uh, under observation for an indefinite period unless you're quite literally insane. I mean, my charges were stock theft and for a goat. Which, yeah, that's an interesting story. Maybe another day. So, I'd paid the price. I'd endured the consequences for my actions. And so, my, my parents, in hope that I'd learnt my lesson, allowed me to return back to South Africa, allowed me to return back into, the, into their home. And they supported me in, trying, in me trying to, you know, start to study again, trying to, you know, pick up the pieces of my life. But it wasn't long before I just went back to what I knew best. Smoking, drinking, and now it had a, an almost arrogant, arrogant nature to it. I've been to rehab, I've been to prison, I mean, I'm on school. <laughs> And I didn't, at that stage, I didn't even care about the psychosis. I was drinking, I was smoking. I just wanted to stop being. I couldn't, I guess I couldn't live with myself as myself. My, my parents had found, had been, Though they were hesitant in the beginning, for them this idea of mental disorders is you know, white people problems. <laughs> but they had come about to realize that there was something wrong with me in that regard. I did have this depression, I did have um, this propensity for schizophrenia. And now they were willing to support the diagnosis to send me to see a specialist. So that aspect of it was dealt with. I did have medication, but I didn't let go of my self-medication. I st started mixing and matching and looking back now, that's probably the leading cause for all that psychosis. Mixing and matching and just trying to get the best of both worlds. So, just before arriving at Rail, I went to one more 28-day um, rehab where they managed to again stabilize my mind after the damage I'd done. My family had endured another episode of psychosis. My family had had enough. They were at their wits end. What, what more could they do? And so I guess at that stage we were both hopeless, desperate. And for me I was at my wit's end. Through it all though, I'd never let go of my relationship to God. If anything, it seems to to be able to survive all these turmoils and drama and it was only I remember the, arriving on the farm and feeling that peace I'd come here thinking this is where I'm gonna die I've given up on any hope of life I've given up on any hope of a future of being able to live with myself as myself And the day I arrived and looked at those snow-capped peaks, 
without that serenity. I knew that I was home. I even remember saying to my sister that it's it's paradise. And and now I'll speak on what I've learned. In my two years at Rail, I can honestly say that it doesn't feel like that. It feels like I just arrived a month ago. And in that time, I've come to understand what Paul meant when he wrote to the people in Rome and said that God is able to turn all things into, into, into good for us work every situation for our good and it only really sunk in when I was here when I'd look around and say and think for all that hurt for all that pain that I dished out and received back and it's to take all of that and bring about a place where I can come to know myself to be able to live with myself as myself to be able to realize that I do have some redeeming qualities I'm not so hopeless after all that it's only God who can take that brokenness and hold it back together again, build something stronger from it. And for me, that is, that is how you know it's God. Because only God can make something good come out of all this pain and suffering. Only God can bring about this result and so what have I learned? <laughs> I've learned that it's okay not to be okay that we all have a part to play that it's it's much easier to judge actions than people. I've learned to see God in the wind, in the trees. I've learned to hear Him in the laughter, in those moments of silence. I've learned to love myself, to look at myself in the mirror and say, hey, I'm not such a bad looking oak. I've learned to dream again. I've learned to, to use power tools. <laughs> I've had my first milkshake here. I've come to know not just myself, but to really know and experience and abide and love who God is. Because it is here that I really, that it all came together. I mean, Only God would put me in a place like this whilst the world is burning around me and keep me safe, keep me warm, keep me fed. But what more could I ask for? And looking back now, he's been faithful. 
And that's something I've seen time and time again on the farm. The miracles, the, the growth that I've seen in others in my time here. And just the way he works in a subtle way. Almost... Yeah, in a, it's, it's amazing. And all of that, <laughs> thank you, Auntie Michelle. Um, and all of that, is, is such a, it's just a drop <laughs> in the ocean that is rail, that is recovery, that is my time here. The friendships I've made, the, the tears, the, the laughter, it's, it all played a part in the healing, in the journey of discovery. In understanding that there's a bigger picture than just drugs or not using drugs because ultimately it's not about the substance it's about the mindset the the lifestyle the passion you hold and it's been on the farm that I've started to discover that the best way to ensure that I don't go back to using drugs is to make sure that I have something that I love that I'm enthusiastic about more than the drugs a passion that fuels and fires me up more than the, the urge to use because true to form I love drugs I mean drugs are pff, woo. <laughs> but what becomes of me and what drugs make of me not so boy. I feel as though my journey is only beginning where it leads only God knows but that's that's fine I think it's safer that way that only God knows because then I'll have I'll need him <laughs> to get me there so I hope that that share reached even one person who could go hey I could relate to that and thank you for spending your time with me this evening um, and I also would like to thank Mr. Hall uh, and Mr. Schuler for the work they do and the patience they have and the love that they show for our kind and all mankind the unconditional love it is noted and appreciated and I'd like to thank you all for joining for joining us tonight and ultimately I'd like to thank God for bringing us for bringing all of this together as only he can yeah. as only he can right thank you love you and good night Evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, it's Carl. Good to yeah, see you guys all again. Uh, Sam, thank you very much. It was an absolutely beautiful share. It is always a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, Sam is a gentleman who I yeah, Sam is a gentleman who I think I tried to befriend 
try, try to befriend from the very moment I got you. Um, his spiritual walk is incredibly strong. Uh, I think those of you that are in recovery will understand this is a spiritual, non-religious program. And there's no way that we get through the struggle, uh, you know, without a, a deeper understanding of our higher power. You know, it's through spiritual, it's, it's our spiritual or, or spiritual contact with our higher power and with God that helps us root out those really deeply seated, you know, personal, um, uh, emotional and spiritual uh, scars that we carry, you know, through, throughout our life. How's it, how's it, Landre? Um, and Sam is one of those men that's just, uh, he's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the scripture, when it comes to, to understanding God, when it comes to building a relationship with God. Um, again, he's somebody that, that I spend a lot of time around when I, when I got you. Um, somebody whose company I've always enjoyed. Uh, we could sit here well into the night having conversations about our personal experiences um, and mostly about how God, you know, how without God we would never have been graced with a place like and how we can still look back at our past mistakes and, and realize that every one of those mistakes was a potential opportunity for, for, for our maker to teach us something. You know, now we can look back at the, those mistakes and we can use them um, as lessons rather than just things to be resentful for or hold regret for. And that's, I think, a message that Sam carries. Um, if, if you ever have the pleasure to be here and to interact with the guys, you'll see that that's something Sam does exceptionally well with all the guys. Um, I, I'm yet to hear somebody come here who's who's hungry for that spiritual side of things that doesn't doesn't go running to Sam to ask him questions because he's such a wealth wealth of knowledge in that regard. So Sam, thank you very much. It was beautiful to hear you speak again. Um, always a pleasure to you know to, to hear Sam share. And um, yeah, I think uh, again another example. You know, Sam touched on uh, how the beginning of his you know his drugging career started with the pharmaceuticals which is something i think some of the guys like myself that just that just went straight with the dirty street drugs you know we disconnect from that and we forget that that's a reality you know, there's many people suffering today from addiction not just because of the, of the dirty illegal street drugs but because of as sam said those things that are considered normal or acceptable things you can go and buy uh, with a with a script you can go buy over the counter and walk out with uh, in your hand and not have to be afraid of who's going to see you with them or or what the uh, oh yeah, or what people are going to you know say say about it? Pay maintenance. Yes, Mr. Hall, that's exactly <laughs> why. <laughs> that's that's one of the reasons why I'm here, Mr. Hall, so that you can teach me to be a productive, responsible member of society, uh, and I mean that um, with with all honesty. Um, yeah, another a, a, another example of how we can all fall into this trap from any angle. Uh, you know, it's not just the gangsters and and the street fall into this or even as sam said i think i relate to some of sam's story because i myself uh didn't have a, an exceptionally rough upbringing i wasn't raised in in a suburb where drugs were rough i, I didn't go to a school where it was you know in my face you, you know every day but i think when we have this thing in us when we have this addict in us when we suffer from the disease of addiction it catches us one way or another we we find it or, or it finds us and we end up finding ourselves you know f sooner or later through one way or another falling into the trap and, and i think sam obviously gives us gave us some insight into how that's possible not just through you know through the street tracks um crackers cracker heads like maintenance just reading some of the comments so again yeah thank you for joining us guys thank you sam for the share um yeah again it's always beautiful to hear sam uh, uh, speak i hope that you guys enjoyed his story um uh, i hope that maybe to the support out there it, it can open eyes as to um uh, open eyes as to how easy it is to fall into this trap even from the the less conventional drug way but the more conventional even mainstream medicine route is still a way that we can fall into this trap um what's that mr hall um yeah i'll try to speak a little bit more just to yeah fill up a little bit of time um i think uh you know even sam's even sam's story you know for, for a young man that started on pharmaceuticals uh, started with painkillers for something that was actually needed, uh, eventually found that that addictive part of his personality took over and, and he was taking those painkillers, still lands up uh, 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 in an institution. Um, you know, what do we say? We suffer from a disease whose ends are always the same, jails, institutions, and death. And there's something as innocent as a painkiller can lead a man to the exact same place that, that many of us here have been, um, and some of us through much harder, or much harder, uh, much more uh, accepted as 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 the type of drugs that would lead you to that kind of place or, or lead you down that you know that sort of road 
Um, yeah, uh, somebody here said, uh, Mr. Schuler, you said, does not discriminate. Um, uh, twofold, I'd say Sam does not discriminate. And amen, uh, d the disease of addiction does not discriminate, you know. Um, it, 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 it has no balance. I think, I feel like I'm maybe just you know, pre preaching to the choir, but those of us who have suffered and... Uh, we all know how much you love the camera call. <laughs> Keep going. Well, I'm on my own iPad now. It, it looks quite good, so maybe I will. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, uh, yeah, it, it, it does not discriminate. I think that's, as an addict um, in recovery, that is one of the beautiful advantages of being in a place like RAL. Um, uh, RAL in particular, I have been in other institutions, and I've got to be honest, depending on the institution and how they position themselves, Sometimes you can find a lot of the same type of people um, uh, rocking up at the same type of people rocking up at uh, you know at a particular rehab. You can almost find a rehab draws a particular group or crowd of individuals, and um, and and uh, yeah, and that's that. Whereas yeah, we have a beautiful blend. Yeah, we have men from every walk. Uh, we have those that that were subjected to and took on the gang life. Uh, we have those that. Um, we're corporates and running their own businesses. Um, we we even have those who, who didn't go that seemingly conventional route, still found themselves, uh, you know, walking the same path. And I think the beauty of that, not that there's anything beautiful about any of us suffering from addiction, but the beauty of of being around those that being in this type of environment with that much diversity, is that uh, Lee. Is that it affords the still suffering someone like myself the opportunity to open my eyes um, and realize, <laughs> open my eyes and realize that um, I am an addict. I cannot differentiate. This disease does not discriminate. There's nothing I'm going to point out in myself and be able to say, yeah, but I'm different this way. God has a face for radio, especially these guys over here. Um, yeah, there's, there's nothing that I'm going to find. To, to excuse my behavior um, or justify uh, justify not being an addict or justify being able to 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 forget this program and forget everything Mr. Hall is teaching us here you know it, it it's incredible no, uh, <laughs> it wasn't too much different it was just like this all of the time um, it, yeah it, it's beautiful to have Mr. Shula it's beautiful to have the opportunity to real, to yeah I've lost my train of thought with all with all the heckling um, it, yeah it, it's it's you'd be amazed at how much you can learn from a completely different perspective you know sometimes especially with with maybe when you when you meet a guy that comes from a similar walk or a similar background it's easier because you know out how uh, but in in when I was in that situation I responded this way or I responded that way or I, I deal with that situation this way or differently to my peer and that somehow must make me different that way he must be worse than me but when you when you get to uh, speak recovery and sp share experiences with someone that comes from a completely different uh, walk of life at least in my personal experience it opens the door to to looking at yourself and going but even although there's so many differences we're exactly the same the disease is exactly the same the way that i manipulate the way that i use the way that i think uh, the way that i respond the way that i deal with stress the way that i deal with pressure is no different even although this brother is completely different from me and that has to mean that there, that there's this common denominator and the common denominator is the disease of addiction um, I feel as though those differences force me into a position where I must realize that the evidence is still on TikTok. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Yon, is this revenge? <laughs> the evidence is on TikTok. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I shared it before. Absolute psychosis. Uh, again, that's something, that's something I relate to. Um, Spurs still looking for their crowds. It's something I relate to. Uh, something I relate to with regard to you know Sam share is my drug use took me to the point, and I think some of you we've all we've all we've all got a little bit loopy when we've taken a bit too much, um, but I think some of us hit the point where we activate something that was maybe always there, um, or you, but I've lost train of this conversation, but it seems like it must be incredibly interesting. <laughs> I think I don't know if I want to know or don't want to know what all of these things. Uh, <laughs> What all of you, what you guys are discussing, um, yeah, I think what what I wanted to say is, I think most of us have taken drugs to the point where we've induced some sort of psychosis, where we've experienced the severe paranoia or the delusions or, 
or what have you. I think, you know, my personal walk, uh, I came to a point, uh, I believe I'm at a point now where I no longer get high, I go psychotic. That's the bottom line. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's one or a thousand, it doesn't matter if it's just a little bit, or if I pick up, I am immediately thrust into a place where I experienced, uh, where I experienced, um, I haven't diagnosed him yet. He's still confusing me. This is this is how I do it, doctor. Just bounce around a little bit and keep and keep you guys guessing. <laughs> um, what are you, a criminal or an addict first? Sure, Mr. Schuler. What a what a class question. I'm, I want to answer your question. I want to try to think about answering your question, but uh, l let me say this: induced psychosis. That's something I related to with, with Sam shares. It's not just the jails, institutions, or death. It's full-blown uh, full blown psychosis. You know, some of us recover but are forever now on chronic medication, you know, as a result. Um, some of us can no longer use without going completely, you know, crazy. Uh, just like Sam, I, I can relate to the p part of his, of his story where his own folks, uh, you know, in the end got him arrested. My, my own folks in the end got me arrested. And I don't, I don't hold any resent against them for it. I think it was the best thing they could have possibly done. And it was at the end of a three-month binge, and at the end of that um, three-month binge, it was full-blown psychosis. I think I was spraying Coca-Cola all over my flat, thinking I'm fighting demons or something along the lines, uh, something along those lines. And, and I think that they themselves were afraid for their own safety and for mine. You know, that's how severe the psychotic episodes, um, the psychotic episodes became. I, I, I can, I can even recall. Um, a policeman, a well-known policeman in my very small town approaching me uh, alongside of a river and saying to me, um, Carl, what did I speak to you about? And I had to say to him, sir, you told me that I'm not allowed to make a scene uh, in public during the daytime, but only at night time when, when, when the, the, the general population within Port Alfred is not able to see me. And then taking me back home and asking me if he should drop me off outside my house where my parents would see or just down the road. Um, it's on its way, Mr. Hall. Maybe that's why I should wrap this up quickly so that I can get back to work. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, that, that's the, that's the, I think that's another reality. Um, uh, this disease has no, as you said, Mr. Schuller, it does not discriminate. Uh, it, it has, uh, I, I don't know what the word is I, I want to use here, but it has no borders or boundaries. It, it, it doesn't discriminate, um, and the and the places it will take you to. Uh, again, uh, when thinking of Sam, it makes me think of Scripture. You know, kill, plunder, destroy. That's a chaos. If if there's any way that it can burn you or break you, that is where the disease of addiction will take you. Um, and I think that some of you guys, uh, I've heard Mr. Schuler speak on on something similar. I say the disease and not the drugs because the drugs are only the symptom. Uh, um, are only a symptom of the disease. The drugs are always the end result. You know, my, my disease is alive and well in the way that I think the, in terms of how I, how I deal with situations, how I deal with life, how I respond to pressure, how I respond to pain. You know, Mr. Hall shared brilliantly last night on fear, how I respond to fear. Uh, you know, the disease of addiction means that my response to all forms of, of difficulty, pressure, pain, uh, all forms of adversity, um, are always uh, the most destructive uh, means possible. Um, just always end, end in needing to take the drugs. Um, uh, amen, Diane. Uh, needing to take the drugs in order to self-medicate. Um, and, and, yeah, I think that, uh, as Sam, as Sam uh, accurately said, you self-medicate too much and eventually you find yourself in a place where... You, you, you don't need the drugs anymore and and you've suffered permanent damage permanent psychosis permanent schizophrenia you know um it's it's again it's it's one of those things if it's not jails if it's not inst institutions because of the psychosis or death it leaves you with a, lo a lifelong you know ailment that you're going to have to suffer from uh, for the very left rest of your life sir no no mr Schuler, criminal or addict a beautiful a beautiful question um you know, beautiful question because the nature of my disease as an addict uh, means means that I I press myself to do something criminal every day. Uh, most of the drugs that we're picking up are not legal, uh, even when they are legal drugs and we and we're taking prescription drugs. Are we not uh, pushing the prescription? Are we not conning a doctor in order to give us a script we don't really need? Um, are they not, uh, Doctor Doctor Rihanna Detroit will tell us better. Are there, are there not regulations around? I mean, will the chemical 
put me away when I come back for uh, when I come back too many times, you know. Um, I think they do. So, uh, am I a criminal or, or an addict first? I think that that the two are probably very closely, you know, intertwined. The thinking of an addict and the thinking of, of the criminal, I think, are one and the same. Perhaps that because the nature of our addiction forces us to do things that are criminal, even if that's just even even if we never rob or steal or even if that's just uh, going to pick up drugs, you know, on the street corner when we know that we shouldn't be doing it. And I think that, you know, um, as an addict who lied and manipulated and deceived everybody in my life all of the time, um, uh, it be, I think criminal ways became a way of life, learning how to lie, learning how to hide things behind people's backs, learning how to deceive people, uh, you know, at all times, learning how to put on one face while what's going on inside or, or in my head or what I'm doing behind closed doors is completely different, you know. Um, I might not have been, I might not have been stealing your, your possessions, but I, I was robbing you of your thoughts when I, when I had you thinking something of me that wasn't true. Um, I, I might not have been, you know, um, sneaking in your house to take something when you couldn't see, but I was sneaking around behind your back to do and say, to do things that you had no idea I was busy doing. So while I might not have been a thief in the conventional method, in the emotional and the psychological, if from a, an emotional or a psychological point of view, I was most certainly a criminal. Uh, robbing everybody of, uh, sapping everybody around me thing uh, that they had to give from an emo emotional point of view um, at all times. So uh, addict or addict or, or criminal, uh, maybe Sam said it best, Mr. Schuller, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think in the end, um, by the time we realize we are addicted, uh, we are so intertwined with both. That there is no, you know, that there is no differentiation, and and even that, you know, uh, uh, if I can share just one one short, do you do you maybe want to come close for us? No, not now. Okay, um, if I can share just you know one short experience, I, I remember um, being locked up for, you know, uh, Mr. Schuler, criminal criminal or addict, you know, uh, going to court for failure maintenance, which is a civil matter, um, having enough money to pay it, but because I'm too busy drugging, robbing my children of what they deserve, uh, landing up in a place where it's no longer civil, but now it's contempt of court because there's a court order demanding that I pay um, uh, a certain amount. Uh, many doctors do indeed. Uh, uh, you're demanding that I pay a certain amount and I'm not. So now it becomes, uh, you know, a criminal matter, uh, which puts me, I think, in that place where it's a bit of both addict and uh, and both of, of what I'm robbing my children of from their own well-being point right through to disobeying the law and the, and, and the authority. Um, and, and then landing up in prison. And, you know, the, one of the strangest things, when I was in prison, I took the time to try to speak to everybody that, that was there. Once I had settled in and uh, <laughs> as a France, maybe that meant I could move between the members without difficulty. So, <laughs> yes, sir. So... Um, while I was in prison, what I did was I took the time to speak to almost everybody there that I could. I friend, you know, everybody humanly possible, and, and I tried to uh, get to know all the guys. Um, and, and I asked a lot of them, obviously, how they landed up there, try to understand their lives better. And, and you know, um, the reason I saw it say on-point question, Mr. Schuller, is I, I did not meet a single convict or a single man a meeting trial who could not say that one way or another he had not landed up there because of drugs. It, it, whether they were, they had stolen cars, why were you stealing cars? He was stealing cars to make money for drugs. If they were professional robbers, they were breaking into, were walking into malls with guns blazing, why were you robbing into the malls? Because they needed drugs. Yeah, of course, you have the, those that are there for possession and you, and you have those that are there for dealing, but it, somehow it seems as though 99% of, of the population within a waiting trial, even within sentencing, uh, was one way or another, directly or indirectly, as a result of drugs. And that's incredible. You think that we have a, an open system and a judicial system that can't ha That's why we have guys sitting in a waiting trial two years, three years sometimes, is because of the overcrowding and the mass of individuals that are going in there. And then you, you come to find out, if you have the time to one-on-one -on -one with someone, uh, you come to find out that just like me, we were there because of directly or indirectly drugs, our use of drugs or our abuse of drugs. It almost leaves me, the thing not leaves me, it definitely leaves me, not almost, it definitely leaves me thinking that, that some of the things Mr. Hall shares and some of his sentiment um, is so on point.
could drugs be the greatest pandemic that we face in this country and within our society or first world societies as a whole? Thir first world, third world, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, I don't think we take the time to realize that drugs and addiction uh, is feeding so much, uh, so much other suffering, so much other pain. A prison system and a judicial system, they can't keep up with the amount of, of criminals coming through. And the main issue being how many of them are because of their addiction. How how many how many men would not be on the street stealing and not be backing up the the, the prison and the judicial system if their first pro and and foremost problem wasn't drugs? Um, I think that it testifies, at least in my experience, it testifies to the fact that one of the greatest pandemics this world has faced and is going to face for foreseeable future until such time as we take it seriously um, is drugs uh, and and drug addiction. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say on it, just to just to echo some of words, because he is the spiritual man. I, I think I've all in my personal walk, I've always believed, I've always believed that drugs uh, is without a doubt Satan's greatest weapon on the face of this planet, uh, because I think some of you will know better than anybody else. He only needs to infiltrate one. You infiltrate me, and suddenly I have the power to ruin my entire family. You just get one member of a family uh, uh, hooked, and an entire family can be pulled apart. You know, to the point where I put, pull even my own family apart, you know, with regards to my own children and, and um, yeah, the history that I've already shared here. Um, but I think that's me. I think Mr. Hall wants to, wants to have, have a word with us. Uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Please share the group. Please share the video. Please tell whoever you know to come and join us. Uh, let's try to grow this uh, as, as big as we humanly possibly can. But now I hand over to Mr. Anthony Hall. Okay, good evening. It's been a bit um, longer than normal. Um, I don't apologize for the noise, Diane. I run a rehab with 36 people and they come into the house and some of them have issues at 10 o'clock in the morning, some have issues at 10 o'clock in the night, some have issues all the time and the rehab comes first. I'm a big believer what my dad taught me, get your house in order first then you can go and help anyone else. So, I apologize for that, but the rehab has to carry on. You know, people come in here, we've got dogs and we've got other people who are, um, my, my leaders have to come and report to me. So that's just the way rehabs work. Um, I'm reading there. Okay, now I'm going to tell you something personal so we can get all that crap out of the way. Yes, um, from the rumors that are going around, I am getting divorced tomorrow. It is not, it's very difficult to probably put into words how to say this. Um, but I think I've been a very straight person my whole life and I don't talk in the gay sense. I talk in just like what I, what I think I say and that's it. And, and uh, I will suffer the consequences if I, if I, uh, if I say something wrong. I did not. And I'm going to put this on record straight, contrary to what people think. I did not have a sexual affair with Dr. Detoy before I separated from my wife and we started going out. I did not leave my wife for Dr. Detoy. I left the, what, my wife and we broke up to the breakdown of our marriage. And that's what gets handled in court tomorrow. So I think, you know, for the, for the people that have sent me messages and asked me, Obviously, it's, it's leaked out somewhere about your divorce. I, I think it's a, it's a private matter, and I think it should be handled with dignity. And um, I, will never, I will never ever will I slander, slander Karen. She did a massive amount here at rail. But tomorrow starts a new chapter in my life. And at, at the age of 56, you know, we haven't got uh, hundreds of years left. I, I'm always up for a challenge. I hope that uh, my relationships with, with uh, or my relationship with um, Dr. Detoy works, and only time will tell. But I'm I'm dedicated to my calling that I do, and I, I believe I do it very well, and I'm dedicating to uplifting and to helping people recover from addiction recovery, uh, addiction and substance abuse. So yes, it's it's it's. It isn't easy. I know that my private life is my private life. But um, the messages I get, 
I know I'm in the public eye, but the messages I get are actually, it's not you people on this page, but maybe you know some of them are quite disgraceful and disgusting. But I can, I, I can take it because I will stand for, for, for what I want to and what I believe in. And I will continue and I will not shy away. And no one must ever say, like they've told me on inbox that Dr. DeToy broke up my marriage because that is an ultimate lie. And if I hear it again, I'm going to go to the high court and I'm going to sue that person. So that is it. New chapter tomorrow. I'm spiritually strong. I am feeling good. I, I believe life carries on. There are people worse off than, 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 than us tonight. I think tonight we had, uh, especially when Carl was on, a bit of fun. And that's how we have the banter at the fun. I'm going to ask when Clatsy was here. Obviously, Kurt, my manager. Gladwin. Even, even Michelle, when she testifies here. Michelle, a mother of an addict whose son is with me. Uh, she will tell you the fun that we have here. Nothing's personal. You know, we've even been accused of being racist here. We don't take black people. Well, I don't know if Sam put on nugget before he came to speak to you. That's the crap we have to deal with every day. Addicts are under pressure every day. My life is under pressure all the time. And don't feel sorry for me, but it's under pressure. Because people just want to cru crucify and make a person go down. Most people would rather have people relapsing on that. T believe me when I tell you this, than actually being sober and being happy. Everyone, you know, we got this satanic church that has just opened up Century City. They would prefer that to be packed with addicts on, on drugs than a normal church when we are trying to save our lives. I just want to tell you one thing clear about uh, and And... Um, you know about Sam, it's probably, and I'm not saying this because Sam has just spoken, but there's other people on this wall here who can testify to it. Sam is probably one of the most humble men or men you'll ever meet in your entire life. He's got a beautiful father who's a professor at a university in Cape Town and a mother that's head of a teaching association. And they come and when they visit, humble, beautiful people, you know, and it looks like Sam is going to... Sam is going to um, Sam is going to stay a long time with us. Rihanna does remind me it's, it's like Sam is going to apologize in 10 years time for putting nugget on his face like that stupid fool Rob Van Fieren did. More people speak out about what is happening instead of ha worrying about what's happening in people's personal lives. We'll have a better country. We will build a country. We'll build a nation. We're getting and, and, and this, I've got a lot of reports today about the, the COVID virus. And, and obviously, we, we take all advice and we, we cut it up and see what is the truth. Keep safe out there, people. Really keep safe out there and, and, and keep close to each other. Let's pray for each other instead of running each other down. It's, it's, it's irrelevant who's married and who's single and who's not. Because then lives must be boring. But I, but I will be able to... I've taken it since I've opened this organization. I've had people stab me in the back. I've had people rob me of money. And there's some people that owe me a lot of money, including pastors here in Worcester. I'm not talking about 50,000 rand. I'm talking much more. But if I'm going to carry that resentment, I'm going to go back to alcohol. To me, another day. God spared me another day. He spared me a lovely day today. And um, hopefully have a good night's sleep, all of us. And tomorrow we can face another day, another challenge. Like Winston Churchill says, bring on the challenges. And then he said one, one important thing. I've made enemies in my life. I must have done something right. God bless you all. All stay sober. And um, it was a lovely meeting tonight. I was, I was sitting on the couch listening to, to the banter with Carl and and for the boys who've been through here, we all know something about each other. It's nothing derogatory, nothing bad, nothing, you know, from Kurt stealing crayons at, at, uh, at four years old. We rip each other off, man, because we men, men. We know what hell is like, man. We've been there. We know what hard times are like, man. We've been there. 
And when we rip each other, other off here with the banter that we have amongst each other, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's just something that you don't experience. And we become a brotherhood. We become a brotherhood. And there's a couple of parents that are part of the brotherhood. And they know how we rip off because they, they sit with us. Or they, they listen to the phone calls that we have on speakerphone. We, we, we can't be unhappy in recovery. Because if I'm unhappy in recovery, then I may as well be drinking and drugging. I wanted to change my life, and, and I know uh, Graham the Great, in two days' time, celebrates five years in recovery. Five years from heroin. I only know two people in my, in my whole career has gone past five years. And that is two people that have walked through the doors of rail. Freddie Cars and Graham von Rainsburg. So that's been an honor. That's been a pleasure. No money can buy that. That's what makes life worthwhile for me. So my private life basically has got fuck all to do with anyone. As long as I'm doing the next right thing. As long as I'm doing the next right thing. Every kid that comes into my house is a kid of 30 or a kid of 70. Will be treated with the utmost respect. And he will get the best recovery there is to offer. So God bless you and uh, tomorrow night, all of us, and let's stay friends. And we love you, Lee J in London. We've got a whole mixture of, of where all they're from. And please join us. So send us a, an email. All our details are there. Send us an email and send us a WhatsApp and that. And, and we'll gladly talk to anyone. We had a lady who phoned us today and said that, unfortunately, she's been watching the program. And uh, after three months, she just cracked yesterday. Let's keep her in prayer. Name's not important. In this book, names aren't important. It's how do we help our fellow man and woman. And if we help our fellow man and woman the way we helped, the world would be a beautiful place. Then all lives will, mat will matter. All lives. God bless you. Thank you for